man, thank you guys for singing with us. If it's your first time here, we want to say welcome. We hope you guys feel right at home. We hope you got some coffee and something to eat and are ready to go today. And we're going to keep singing because we love to worship Jesus through music. And then we have a very special guest with us today. I'm not going to give him away yet, but he's here for week two of The Whale. And hey, as we continue to sing this morning, we're going to introduce a brand new song to you all. We're going to be singing about being grateful and thankful for all the amazing things that God is doing and has done in our lives. You sing this song with us.
powerful name. Amen. I love all throughout scripture we can see different examples and different situations where the name of Jesus is used. It was used to raise from the dead, to cast out demons, to baptize people. And at the end of prayers, we always say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You may be wondering why we say that. There are a couple reasons. When we say, in Jesus' name, that means we are bankrupting ourselves of any power that we think we may have. We're admitting that, in Jesus, we are nothing without you. And when we pray, we can pray expectantly because we know that through your power, things can happen, things can change, our needs can be met. When we pray in Jesus' name, we are recognizing that we are attached to him, that we are not just ourselves, but that we are one with Christ, that he is clinging to us and we are clinging to him. And we can pray expectantly, knowing that our needs can be met, knowing that things in our lives can change, our financial situations, our relationships, they can change for the better because of the power of Jesus' name. So this morning, if you have a need, I invite you to just raise your hand. I have needs, I know we all have needs here. We're gonna pray over each and every one of those here in this place. Jesus, we love you, we praise you, and we trust you here in this place today. God, we give you all of our needs, God, all of our burdens, all of our struggles. God, we may have walked in here with a backpack full of bricks, God, and I pray that we can walk out of here feeling free. God, feeling this, a massive weight lifted off of our shoulders because, God, you are here because we are praying in your name, the name that has power to remove everything, God. We love you, Jesus. We give our needs to you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus, the name that conquered death, that tore the veil, that gives us this opportunity to pray to you, Jesus. We love you. It's in your name we pray today. In your name, in the powerful name of Jesus. We are so glad that you chose to spend part of your weekend with us. Pastor Mitch Rose will be up in a minute to continue our series, The Whale. But before he comes, here are some things happening around North Rock Church. If today is 
your first time at North Rock, we want to say thank you for coming. You are a VIP and all of North Rock family wants to welcome you. Do us a huge favor and fill out a connection card in the seat in front of you and drop it off at our VIP tent on your way out today. Our team would love to say hello, answer any questions you have, and give you a gift to say thank you for being with us today. We hope you enjoy your time with us, and we hope to see you back soon. At North Rock, we believe everyone should be connected to the local church, and we would love for North Rock to be that church for you. The way you get connected at North Rock is through Growth Track. Growth Track is happening today, immediately following the second service at 11.15 a.m. in the office complex adjacent to our building. At Growth Track, we will tell you about North Rock, about membership, and we'll give you the opportunity to join our Rockstar team. Lunch will be on us, and we will even take care of your kids. And if you missed it this week, we will have another opportunity on July 23rd. And maybe you've been through Growth Track already, and you're looking for a community. Joining a small group is a great next step for you. Simply visit our website at www.northrocksa.com slash smallgroups where you can find our full small group list and sign up today. This upcoming Saturday, July 15th is Serve Day. We will be sending teams out to organizations all over San Antonio to make a difference right here in our home city. Serve Day is an amazing opportunity to bless others and be blessed. Thousands will go out into our community and show the love of Christ in a real and tangible way. Make sure you head over to our website and sign up for a Serve location. All right, North Rock Church, for week two of The Whale, we have brought in a very special guest, Pastor Mitch Rose from City Hills Church in Bernie. We are so pumped that he is here with us today. So do me a favor and help me welcome Pastor Mitch Rose. Well, 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 well. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good, good, good. I'm so glad you're here. I, um, what an introduction. I don't know who picked that song, but I like it. And I want it at my church every time I walk on the stage. Every time I come out, I'm going to tell my team that's what I want. Uh, I'm so glad that you're here, and uh, just an honor to be back uh, at North Rock. I love this house. I love what's happening here, and uh, I preached for North Rock when this was it, you know what I mean? And then God's just filling the house three times and more and more and more people meeting Jesus here, having their lives just completely changed and redefined here at North Rock, and I just love what's happening. I honor your pastor, pastors. Uh, Jonathan and Alicia, these people get younger with, it's like Benjamin Button. They never get older. They just, it's just, they're like they're going the other direction. Um, I love them so much. If you're here for the first time, you owe it to yourself to be back when uh, Jonathan's preaching. He's a much better looking guy than I am, but I am a much better preacher than he is. So it's kind of an even trade for you today, be, <laughs> be honest with you. Uh, I am so uh, excited to be here. Let me just say thank you on behalf of our church uh, to City Hills Church. We launched just 10 months ago in the northwest corner of town, up the I-10 corridor, kind of in that hill country area. And in the past 10 months, uh, because of your, really, your giving here, you're one of our, you know, missions partners, and you give monthly to what's happening at City Hills. Because of that, we have seen literally today there are over 300 people already in 10 short months gathering uh, up the I-10 corridor at City Hills. We are seeing dozens of people say yes to Jesus. We've already baptized over 30 so far this year. Come on, you're a part of that. Why don't you celebrate that? So I'm just grateful to you, and when you get to heaven, you're going to meet a bunch of people from, from the Hill Country that you were personally responsible, that they met Jesus uh, in a new life-giving church that you helped plant. So just thank you, thank you, thank you for that. So we're in the second week of a series called The Well, and I'm pumped up about this when uh, Pastor Jonathan asked me to preach for him this weekend. I really, I really enjoy this story. I preached the story of Jonah uh, a lot before, and I'm just super excited about this. I kind of caught up with you and watched uh, last week's message and, and uh, talking with Pastor Jonathan about it. And let me just sort of say right here in the very beginning, in case you're new to church or new to faith or whatever, I, I, I believe this story to be true. Uh, I, I believe that, that this is a narrative in the Bible that really happened. The truth, as a matter of fact, I read something uh, the other day about this. There's a little girl in the fifth grade 
who was doing a speech about Jonah and the well. And so she, she tells the story. She kind of gives this whole story. And the teacher speaks up and, and, and the teacher says, I don't, I don't believe that to be true. Like, I don't think that really happened because I don't know that a whale can swallow a human. I think their throats are too narrow. And, you know, I don't think, I don't think a man can actually get down there. The little girl thinks for a minute. She's just in the fifth grade. She kind of stops. And she says, you know what? I tell you what. When I get to heaven, I'll just ask Jonah what, what happened. Like, what went down? And then we'll just clear it up. And the teacher kind of being smart aleck, she says, well, what if, what if Jonah didn't go to heaven? What if he went to hell? The little girl thought just a moment. She said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> oh, boy, boy, boy. So uh, I believe this to be true. I believe this story uh, actually happened. Let me kind of catch you up. I hope that you have a copy of your message notes once you grab those uh, and follow along with me today. So last week, in case you weren't here, Jonah, the first chapter and um, the first verse says this, that the word of the Lord came to Jonah. This is the way it said, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amitai, which if you're naming a baby, that's a good one, just Amitai. And God said to him, go to the great city of Nineveh. I love how God calls it great. And Jonah's like, you don't know what I know. God ever says something to you and you're like, God, you don't really know what's going on over there. And so God says, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because wickedness has come up. Before me, Jonah is a prophet. It's his job to sort of, you know, declare God's word. And so God says, I want you to go to Nineveh. And when the Bible says that it's a wicked place, I wish I could really tell you and just describe to you with words kind of how wicked it is. It's the, it's the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And the wickedness that happened there, like to innocent men, women, children, if, if I were to tell you, it literally it would make you nauseous. It's just, it's absolutely horrific. And so God says to Jonah, I want you to go east to Nineveh and and and. Jonah says, no, <laughs> I don't know if, if God's ever said something to you like, hey, I want you to go do this. And you're like, God, I appreciate that. No, not going to do that. Matter of fact, not only am I not going to do that, I'm going to go completely the opposite direction. Nineveh is to the east of where Jonah was. Jonah is going to go west. He goes to a city called Tarshish. It's about 2,500 miles away from where he's supposed to be. And so God says, you know what, this mission is too important. I, this, this has got to happen. I'm not going to let you run away from me. So there's this big storm that comes. You were here last week. You know, this big storm comes. Jonah is on a boat in the middle of this. And the storm was so big that it's, a, it's literally about to break open the boat. Like the, the boat's about to break in half, the Bible says. So the captain of the boat that Jonah's on, trying to run away from God's plan in his life, he kind of goes down into the hole where Jonah is curled up in the fetal position, just pretending like God didn't call him and none of this is his fault. I don't know if you've ever gotten somewhere in your life when you kind of, you know what, you know it's your fault, you just don't want anybody else to know that you know it's your fault. And so Jonah's in the bottom of the boat, kind of like, I don't, I don't know what's happening, don't tell me anything that's going on. And and the captain says, Jonah, maybe if you pray that, you know, you're a prophet, call, call on the name of your God and things will get better and he'll save us. And Jonah was a prophet on the run, like he was a prayerless prophet. He wasn't trying to pray at this time. He had stopped praying because he was running away from God. I find this to be true so many times in the people that I lead, not the people here at North Rock, but the other people like in the hill country where I pastor. There are people who all the time get to the point where they need God the most, and that's the time they quit praying. Like they need God to move in their life in a, in, in a big way. They need God to rescue them. And, I, you know, I, they claim to believe in God, but they don't have any prayer life that sort of backs that up. Everybody say amen to that. Like they kind of believe, you know, I, I practically, I think this is, I know God called me, but I don't want to put that into practice in my life. And so Jonah's like, no, I'm not going to pray. I don't want to do it. I'm not in the mood to pray. And so the storm rages on and the sailors go down. So the captain tries and he can't do it. And the sailors come in and they say, Jonah, this is, you got to tell me, you know, what's going on here. This is going to kill us. And so Jonah finally admits, listen, guys, this is my fault. I'm running away from God. And so throw me overboard and everything's going to be okay. I can't tell you the number of people. That, that have gotten, like in the, in the time that, that, you know, that I, I've met with people that sort of say, look, it's my fault. Just throw me, like, God doesn't need me. I'm done. I'm leaving. I'm walking away from my marriage, from my church, from my kids. Walking away from my job, walking away from the calling I have. And this is sort of where Jonah's at. He's just such at a low point. He's like, just throw me overboard and everything's going to be okay. And the sailors go, we're not going to do that. And then the storm gets worse. And the sailors are like, you know what? About that throwing overboard thing. <laughs> like, uh, if, if that's still on the table, I'm still kind of interested in that. We don't have any other choice. And they said, we're sorry. And so we're going to do it. So last week, we kind of ended right here. Jonah 1 and verse 17 says, and the Lord provided a great fish. So they threw him overboard. And the Lord provided a great fish. This was not just by accident. Listen, when you find yourself... 
in the middle of trouble, it's not by accident. It's most likely that God's provided a way for you to be saved. And God provides this great fish or a well that swallowed Jonah where he spent. And underline this in your notes, three days and three nights in the belly of a fish. Now, God could have done anything for that. Like, God, God could have, you know, rescued him in any way whatsoever. And, and so the next passage, we're, gonna, we're actually going to go, I don't do a lot of this kind of preaching, but we're going to kind of go verse by verse in the next chapter, Jonah, the second chapter. And this is called the prayer of Jonah, or some theologians call it the psalm of Jonah. This is like his prayer to God. This is after he's thrown into the water and he's inside the belly of this fish. And God could have chosen any way to rescue him. I've thought about that a lot. Like God could have said, you know, anything he could have said, you know, I want to rescue you with a giant sea turtle. And Jonah could have hopped on the back of it and just rode in. You know, I don't know what could have happened, but anything could have happened. But for whatever reason, God sent this great fish and he's in the belly of this fish. I don't know what that looks like. I just believe that it happened. And so when you read Jonah, the second chapter, all you get is kind of a Snapchat, a uh, uh, Snapchat, snapshot of what, you don't get a Snapchat, snapshot of what Jonah is actually saying. You, 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 ever, you ever like hope that nobody heard your prayers because if they heard you pray, they'd be embarrassed for you. You know what I'm saying? And this is kind of Jonah's life. Like if you read Jonah, the second chapter, it sounds like poetry. It sounds amazing. Let me tell you what really happened. Jonah is writing this book. Like after he already goes to Nineveh, after God saves all of Nineveh, he spares. After, after Jonah is, uh, Jonah's, you know, completed what he's supposed to do in Nineveh, then he writes and he kind of remembers what he prayed. But I promise you, this is not exactly it. Like I'm, if I'm Jonah in the belly of a fish for three days, I'm talking about help, help. Like I don't know what it sounds. I'm speaking well. Like eh, 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 eh. what? What do you need to get me out of here? That's what I'm saying in the belly of this fish. But Jonah kind of when, he, when he's remembering back. In this, he neglects God, and he starts to pray, and this is how he remembers his prayer. And so he wrote this very beautiful part. We're just going to go verse by verse of that. I hope that you follow along or you know. So Jonah, the second chapter, opens up like this. From the inside of the fish, this is where we find him, like, you know, in the middle of the, the problem that he created, and God provided a, a rescue for him in the fish. Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God. In other words, God says to Jonah, listen, I've got your attention now. Now all of that, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to talk to God business you were doing on the boat. I've got your attention now. The, oftentimes in your life, in my life, God will sort of bring something into your life, and you think, man, why did this happen? And then before you know it, you realize, man, I'm more spiritual now than I've ever been. Has that ever happened to anybody in the room? Like I'm at the point right now, God, you've got my attention. You know what I mean? I'll start talking. And so Jonah starts praying, and he says, in my distress, I called to the Lord. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. I really want you to pause right there. I don't want you to just go over this because this is absolutely remarkable. I want you to grasp that the God of the universe, the creator of everything that ever was, the one who spoke stars into the sky, our entire universe, the first, the last, the beginning, and the end, the holy God of Israel, like that all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present help, like Jonah calls on him, and the Bible says that God who can do anything at any time for anybody answers him. I, I don't want you to sort of leave this moment without realizing that the God of all, and not just the God of all creation listens, but he listens to somebody who just a few moments earlier had basically said, forget you, God, I'm not going to do what it is that you want me to do. I love this about God. It's the reason why I serve the God of the Bible. It's the reason why I preach about the God of the Bible. It's the reason why I, I, I give my whole, my whole life, my whole heart to this, because I believe despite kind of maybe how you were raised or how I was raised, that God, God hears us when we pray. And you can call on that God, and he will answer you. When you. It amazes me the number of people that when things get bad, you know what I mean, like get real bad, like bad, 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 <laughs> like things are bad in their life. And here's what they say to me. Last night I was in the hospital with a family from our church and a massive heart attack and just bad, 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 bad. And, and when I get with people like that, it always amazes me. Here's what most people say, that, that I've, I've tried everything else. You know, the doctors have done all they can. Now, all we can do is, all we can do is pray. All we can do is pray. Like, that's, like, like, like that's the la all we can do now is pray. No, 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 listen. It's not all we can do now is pray. It's, that's, the, that's the best thing I could possibly do is take the problem that I'm in and take it to the God of the universe who can answer me when I call. Everybody shout amen to that. Like, that's a big deal, everybody. 
that God would answer somebody who's on the run. And, and, and there's so many people who just say, you know, I, there are even people, I, I get tickled at this on Facebook because I'm, I'm friends with y'all on Facebook. And some of y'all, y'all tickle me because somebody would give this whole thing about what's going on in their life. You know, it's bad. My husband, my dogs, you know, got cancer, yada, yada, whatever. Everything's, everything's terrible. And, and inst- you won't even say because you're too ashamed to say like you're a Christian on Facebook because, you know, you don't want like all those people. And so you just say, I'm sending good vibes your way. How do you send good vibes? I, somebody in this room, tell me how you send good vibes. Do you like hold your head and like, like how, do, how do you send good vibes? You don't send, listen to me. If I'm in trouble in the, in the middle of a well, in the belly of a well, don't send me no good vibes. Somebody better pray for me. Y'all know what I'm trying to say? Like I want you to call on the God who can answer me. Don't send me good, I'm sending good thoughts your way. How do you send You can't send good thoughts to anybody or good vibes. I'm going to go to God because God can rescue me. Shout amen to that, everybody. And so Jonah says, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to God in my distress. I'm going to go to, as a matter of fact, I want you to, in your notes there, under that word distress or above that word distress, I want you to write this down. This is, you know, Jonah is writing in this Hebrew language, and Hebrew is a, is a, a language of word pictures. And so it's, it's not just letters, there's some, there's some more description there. And the Hebrew word for distress is Sarah, T-S-A-R-H. Sarah, I want you to write this above that word distress right there, T-S-A-R-A-H. And this is, it's pronounced Sarah, it's got a silent T because T's are, ew. Anybody? Jimmy Fallon, anybody? Good. So Sarah, Sarah is this Hebrew word, and here's what it means. It doesn't just mean distress like I'm stressed out. It means distress. It's the same word in Hebrew for a woman who's in labor, who's like in the distress of labor, who's like the pain of childbirth. Now, I tell my wife all the time, she, she almost knows what it's like when I have a cold because she's had two kids. You know what I'm saying? Like she... She almost understands the pain I'm in, but apparently that's a big deal. I don't know. Apparently the pain of childbirth is a big deal, but this is what, this is what Jonah is saying. He's saying, listen, I'm not just a little stressed out. I feel like I need to be born again. And there's some people here today who aren't just stressed out. Like you've, you've moved beyond. You were stressed out last year. Now the situation you're in is dire. Now it looks like there's no hope. Now you find yourself in the middle of, of, of the ocean in a storm in the belly of a fish, and I got to get out of here. And Jonah says, I feel, like, I feel like I just need to be born again, and I call on God, and he answers me. And then listen to the rest of this. From the depths of the grave, I called for help. From the depths of the grave, I called for help. I love that he says this. And you listen to my cry. There it is again, like the amazing thing. You listen to my cry there. A matter of fact, above this word grave right here, above the grave in your notes, I want you to circle that or underline that. I want you to write this Hebrew word. It's shoal. It's S-H-E-O-L. This is a Hebrew word. Maybe you've seen that if you, if you study Hebrew a little bit. This is a, it can be interpreted grave or like the, you know, the land of the dead. But in the King James, which I kind of like the way King James uh, interprets this, he literally calls it hell. So it could read like this. That Jonah was saying, from the depths of hell, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. From the depths of hell, I called on God, and he answered. In other words, he's saying, listen, I'm at the point where I can't contribute anything to my own salvation. I can't do anything to fix myself here. I'm desperate. This isn't just bad. Some of you are in the room today, and you would say, you know what? My marriage is not just bad. It's in hell. Like it's not just hanging on, it's in hell. And, 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 and it seems like some of you would say, you know, on the outside everything seems to be okay, but inwardly, like I'm in hell. Like th- this is not just depression, I'm hurting, I'm afraid, there's anxiety, it's hell right now. And everything seems right, but it's not right. It inside of me is hell. And then, and then Jonah just says this amazing thing, that I cried to God and he answered me. Like I want you to understand, when I needed him most, but I deserved him the least, he answered me. When I needed God to move most in my life, like I, I'm in hell right here. And, and, and this is such a, I love this. This is so rich in, in Hebrew. I really want you to sort of grasp this prayer. Again, Jonah's, he's just kind of remembering. He's using the best words he has to kind of remember what he said. But here's kind of the way that he would say it. He, he, he writes it like this. He says, I'm as good as dead. I'm powerless. I'm in hell. I couldn't do anything about it. I didn't deserve God. But because God is loving 
and still on the throne and he hears me. Even though I'm in pain, he will resurrect me. I can be born again. Everybody, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Shout amen to that. Like, I can't do anything for this. I'm in hell, and some of you know what it's like. I'm speaking to you because you're going through hell. And you don't just need a fix. I, I need a new something. I don't just, I, I, I love to, to say this. Listen, when Jesus comes into your life and revel, completely changes everything about you, there's just an, an absolute change in your life. When you have an encounter with God's presence that forever changes you, God does not, the gospel is Jesus didn't die for it. None of that is to make bad people good. It's not just to fix you. It's to make dead people alive, everybody. Like it's to, it's to completely change everything about you. It's so you can be reborn, not just fix what it is. And some of you know what it's like that are like, man, I know what it's like to need God to fix what's wrong in me. Not just fix me a little bit. Not just kind of patch over my marriage, patch over the thing going on in my head, the thing going on in my life. No, no, no. I want you to know I need God to answer. And I need to be reborn. Like I need something. I'm in hell. God could have chosen any way to rescue you. I, I told you earlier, I, I think God could have sent a, you know, a turtle. God could have sent a mermaid. I don't know why God didn't send a mermaid that looked like Megan Fox. Come on, somebody. Like a mer, like a, like a, with with like with like those braids. You know what I'm trying to say? Like with the with the thing, like uh, like Monica on Friends. You know when she makes all the noise. Y'all know what I'm saying? Like. A mermaid who's like, just, just, you know, come on, let's go. Like, I, I don't know why this happens this way. I don't, know why, I don't know why you had to get as low as you are. I don't know why how the business had to fail. I don't know why she had to walk out. I don't know why he left with the kids. I don't know why it is that you've lost your house. You lost the business that you spent your whole life savings for. I don't know why it is you've gotten to this point where you need medication. Just get out of bed and medication to stay asleep. But I do know this. That God sent whatever it is that you're in to rescue you not to punish you. And if you're not careful, you'll start to just think about the phase that you're in and you don't realize that all of this has been happening, that God's been actively working in your life. Let me let some of you free right now. Where you're at right now is just a phase that you're in, but it's not the final thing in your life. Like just because right now I'm not rescued doesn't mean God isn't working to rescue me. Say amen to that. Like whatever phase, I mean, some of you look over your life, there's phase one, you know, Jonah gets in a ship, that's the first phase, and then phase two, you know, God sends a storm and it doesn't work, and then phase three, God sends the captain down and that doesn't work, and then phase four, God sends the sailors down and that doesn't work, and then phase five, he's thrown over, then in phase six, there's a great fish, and now in phase seven, he's finally praying, but he's still not delivered. Let me just encourage some of you in the room today that you're, you're looking at your life going, man, I don't know what's happening right now. Like, I, I don't know why God has an answer. It could be that you're just in the middle of this process. Here's the way I like to say it. Would you write this down in your notes? Don't overlook all of the little things that God may be doing on the way to your miracle. Like, don't overlook all the small things. I want you to, wherever you are, if you're on phase four, I want you to look back over your life and go, you know what? I'm not where I want to be, but man, God brought me from phase one, and phase one was me running, and then phase two was this thing just hit rock bottom, and phase three sent something along to save me, and now I'm not where I want to be, but in phase four, I'm getting where I want to be. Are you there? Say amen, everybody. I don't want you to forget the little things that God's doing all along the way on the way to your miracle. Maybe... Maybe your healing is a 10-step process. I wish it was a miracle. Do I think God could work a miracle? You bet I do. Do I think it could happen today? Just like that. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's a process. Sometimes it's a phase. And, and here's what I know about God, that he's going to teach you something about himself in every phase that you go through. If you're, if you're to look at my life and think, man, did you think you'd be where you are right now? And, and, and you know, in, the, in your late 30s, you think this is the... Church, you'd be pastoring. Absolutely not. But but it was phase one, and we you know we took a turn here, and then then phase two, there was you know heartache and sort of leaving behind everything that I've ever known, and then phase three, and phase four, and phase one hundred, and we hit a roadblock, and then and, and then you know phase four hundred and twenty three, and phase you know nine thousand seven hundred and fourteen. You think when is this ever going to? I don't know when the phases are going to go, but I'm going to celebrate everything that God's done on the way to the miracle that I know God. God has for me. I'm not going to lose faith that God's working on my behalf. Say amen to that. That there's something that God's doing all along the way. And wherever you are,
God's working. And so Jonah finds himself here, and he says, a cause to the Lord, and he answers. So Jonah's in this fist. God's got his attention. Let, let's, let's work through a couple of verses pretty quickly. Verse 3. He says to God, you hurled me in the depths of, into the very heart of the seas. I love that, that he says hurled, because God didn't do that. The sailors did, but anyway, whatever. So, God, you hurled me. Like, he, he, this is the one time that Jonah's remembering back. Like, God, it wasn't easy. Like, they literally hurled me, okay, everybody? It, like, I, I, you know what I mean? Like a belly buster. Y'all know what I'm trying to say? Like off the high dive. They hurled me into the heart of the sea, and the current swirled about me. And all of you, now he blames God. All of your waves and breakers swept over me. Like, now he's talking to God about all this stuff, verse 4. And I said, I have been banished from your sight. This is what Jonah feels like. God's saving him, and it feels like banishment. God's rescuing him, and it feels like, where are you? Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I love that. And the engulfing waters threatened me. Now he's going back and remember. And the deep surrounded me. This is my favorite part of the whole story. And seaweed was wrapped around my head. That's my favorite part of the whole story. It's like man versus wild. You know what I'm saying? It's like bear grills out there. He's like, God, why did this have to go on so bad? Like, why was this the way it is? Verse 6, it says, to the roots, it was terrible what happened. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. He said, I didn't just get a little wet. I'm in the middle of the ocean, down as far as I I can get the earth beneath barred me forever, but you, Lord my God, underline this sentence, brought my life up from the pit. Verses 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 is so crazy what God's doing in his life. And, it, it, you know, Jonah feels like, man, I'm just at the bottom. I've reached rock bottom. There's nothing here. And he sort of ends with, but you've rescued me. I love this. Pastor Jonathan said this last week that in Jonah, the first chapter, you kind of see over and over again this going down, going down. Like Jonah went down to, you know, the Tarshish, and, and, and then the captain goes down to the hole, and then the sailors go down. He's, it's just kind of Jonah's life sinking down, down, down. He went down. He went to the bottom. He went all the way down. And then in chapter 2, when he starts to call on God, listen, the first thing he does is call on God in chapter 2, and when that starts happening, here's how we, he has this interaction with God and immediately things begin to shift in his life and now he ends this way but you oh God have brought me everybody shout up you've brought me up from the pit the moment he begins to, to you know to sort of have that interaction with God now things are moving up and some of you in the room know what it's like to feel like your life is spiraling out of control going down 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 and I just want to remind you as you write this down never forget the but God moments in your life never forget the moments that God rescued you these but God moments you know these moments like that my life was out of control but God intervened my marriage was beyond repair it was in trouble I thought it was over but God changed everything uh, everything was to the end. The doctor said there's no chance. It said just give up. But God wasn't done with me. And God has the final say. Like it's those but God moments that everything changes. And even though Jonah was, was sort of still in the, you know, where everything, he was still in the belly of a well. Everything wasn't right. He was still physically there. He said, it looks like I'll never survive this. I look like I'm down here forever. But God, but God, but God rescued me. The God of the universe answers me. And then in verse 7, I love how he says this. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you. When my life was ebbing away. I love this sort of back and forth that Jonah has about his story. It's the same story that I have and many of you have. Sometimes I feel like I'm hurled off the ship. And sometimes I feel like it's a slow walk and a slow dance in a burning room. Jonah said, I just felt like it was ebbing away. And some of you, your life, maybe it's not just jumped off the deep end, but it's just ebbing away. And he said, I remembered you, O Lord, in my prayer. There it is again. It's that upward motion. It rose to your holy temple. Some of you today, you're going to remember God, and you're going to say, well, listen, I, 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 don't, I don't know why you say remember God like I haven't forgotten God. I'm in church. Let me just tell you, here's, here's what I think happens sometimes. I don't think that uh, there's some people who discount messages like this and a whole series like this because you say, I'm not as that bad. Like, I'm not in that kind of shape. Matter of fact, things are okay in my life. Things are going uh, all right. Like, we're not, everything's not, you know, falling apart and everything. I'm kind of doing my thing. And when you do that, here's what we often do. We kind of put God on the shelf in our life and you say, you stay over here. I'm going to go over here because everything seems to be okay in my life. 
As a pastor, one of the most hurtful things I do is I see families and couples come to church in the middle of crisis, and I see them week after week, and I see their hands raised and tears fall, and I see them serving their heart out. And then when things begin to progressively get better, they begin to progressively show up less and less. It's because when, I, when things are going well, it seems like I don't need God anymore. And then, and, then he, and, then, and then Jonah sort of recognizes this drift. He says, I didn't jump off the deep end. I just noticed I was drifting away. My life was ebbing away. And he said, I remembered God like I remember what God had done in my life. At this worst point in my life, uh, at this terrible time in my life, and remember, Jonah's writing this in hindsight. He's writing it on the way back, and he says, I remember what God says. I remember, and, and if Jonah was here today, here's what I think he'd tell you. He would say, whatever you do, don't do what I do. Like, don't forget God. Jonah's writing this to a bunch of people that he's retelling this story to, and I think he would say to them, what I'm saying to you is just remember God. Like, just don't let it get so good that you forget, and don't let it get so bad that you just run away. Just remember God's the one who made all of this possible. God's the one who saved you. And I love, at verse 8, I love how he kind of concludes uh, this here. He says, those who cling to worthless idols. Now, remember, Jonah is still a preacher. You can't make a preacher not preach. You can't help it. We can't help it. It's just who I am. My wife gets so mad. She's like, honey, we're just, it's just our kids. I mean, it's just Pokemon. What are we doing right now? I'm like, girl, I'm the man of God. Step back. Jonah's this prophet of God. I'm, I'm kidding a little bit. Jonah's this prophet of God. And he gets kind of the end of this, this chapter here, and this, the old prophet of God just kind of stands up, and he says, oh, by the way, those who cling to worthless idols, they forfeit. Would you underline the word, the grace that could be theirs? He said those that, that sort of worship and cling to worthless idols, they forfeit the grace of God. There's another one of those Hebrew words. It's hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And it doesn't just mean grace like, you know, God forget. It, it means the pursuing grace of God. Like the love of God that chases after me. Like the, it's, it's, it's better said like, like it, it, when, I was, when I was chasing everything else, God was still chasing me. Everybody say amen to that. He says those who cling to worthless idols. Now you're looking at yourself thinking, I don't remember Jonah ever worshiping a worthless idol. Well, here's what I think he did. The first thing I think he did was probably worship prejudice. I really do. Because he, he sort of, he opens the whole book talking about how I don't want to go to Nineveh because those people, those people, those people. Let me just stop right here and pass for just for a brief moment. If you've got a problem with those people, whoever those people are, it's never going to work out. That's an idol you're going to have to deal with. Everybody shout amen. Doesn't matter where they come from, what they look like, what skin color they have, or what background they have. None of that matters. And so Jonah kind of has this prejudice problem. And then he has this worthless idol of self, everybody. Let me tell you about that idol. It's just, it's the idol that says, you know what, I, I just want to do it my way. I want what I want, and I want it my way. It's the idol of my relationships. I know I shouldn't be, you know, in a relationship with him or with her. They're not saved. They're not, you know, I know I shouldn't be sleeping with them, but it's what I want. It's what I'm going to do. It's, I know we shouldn't buy material things and materialism. That's the, the idol of self. It's just saying no to God. And that's where Jonah's at. It's just, I don't really want to give you a reason. I just say no. Jonah's kind of worshiping this idol of I'll do it my way however I want to do or maybe it's success. And when you do that, Jonah says, listen, you forfeit the grace that could be yours, not just grace like God can forgive you, but like this pursuing grace like this. You're missing out on this grace of God that's chasing you down. And then I like what Jonah did. Jonah doesn't make excuses for his life. And I hope that maybe you're there today. You just decide to stop making excuses in verse nine. Here's what he says. He says, what I vowed, I will make good. Now, I ask God, like, what do you mean here? Because when God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh, he says no. Like, he doesn't make a vow to say yes. So what vow are you talking about here? And I started thinking about it and praying about it. Here's what I feel like God told me. He said, you know, there's some stuff in your life that you're not going through right now. There's just some stuff that you said way back when. You know, when you, were, when you were on fire, when everything was good and you said yes to God, he said, that vow. It's the first time God called Jonah. It's the time that God goes to Jonah and says, God, I'm calling you as a prophet. And Jonah says yes to God. And, and, and Jonah's kind of remembering back to that vow. And he says, hey, I'm going to make good on that vow. I'm going to make good on that. God, God's put something on your heart. There's some people in this room who made a vow to God. And I'm asking you to make good on the vow. 
Like there's some people here who said yes to Jesus a long time ago. And then the, through the course of life and kind of what's happened in your life and how bad things have gotten, you've sort of walked away from that. And Jonah gets to the very end and he goes, you know what? I'm not going to make any more excuses. I'll just say yes. I never forget one time. We were at the church we were, we were in. God had kind of put on our hearts. We were in a giving campaign. God had kind of put uh, something on my heart to give. And I never forget telling my wife, and she's not here today. That's why I talk about her so much because she was here. I'd be scared. So I, 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 I told Brandy, I said, here's what I think like God told, told me that we should give. And she said, no, that's the devil. Get, get away. Get behind me, Satan. I said, so the devil told me to give to God. That's what you think. So we had a small uh, discussion about it. And, and so it, when we kind of walked away from it. You know, I said, okay, maybe, maybe I just ate Taco Bell too late. Wasn't God, whatever. And then the next weekend, I felt like God, you know, just, this, I just couldn't get away from it. I went back to Brandy. I said, listen, I think this is what God says. I'll never forget, like, the day we wrote that check, we couldn't, we could not. Listen to me. I'm a preacher. We could not afford it. Come on, somebody. But I made a vow. I said, okay, God, whatever you want, like you got my whole life. And we, we made good on that vow, and I'll do it. And God's made a way in my life that's absolutely beyond anything I could compare. And I, and I love that, that whatever it is that God's called you to do, just do that. Verse 9, he continues on. He, he says, I'm going to make that vow. And then he says, then, then I know this. Therefore, salvation comes from the Lord. He says, after all of this stuff, I finally realized I couldn't do this on my own. I couldn't get myself out of this fish. Like, I couldn't fix myself. Like, I, I, I just recognized, listen, the, the, the best day of your life, listen to me, I'm not just talking to people who are just far from God today. Let me talk to those who are religious or were raised, we were raised in a very religious system like I was. The best day of my life was the day I realized I couldn't earn this. I couldn't do anything for it. Like that salvation just comes from God and, and there's no, I can't. Listen, Jonah couldn't sacrifice an animal in the belly of a fish, everybody. You know what I'm trying to say? He couldn't do enough for God to rescue him. Because salvation comes from God. And then verse 10, I love what happens. When he comes to this realization, verse 10 says, And the Lord commanded the fish, just like that. And even though this is not pretty, he vomited Jonah out on dry land. And I hope this echoes in your heart today, wherever you are and kind of whatever you're going through the rest of your life, that whether you're on top of the world or whether you feel like you're in hell. Here's the last thing I want to tell you and kind of the, the, the crux of Jonah, the second chapter, as we sort of walk through this whole story. Let me just kind of give you the big idea. If you've slept the rest of the message, write this part down. When you call on the Lord. He will answer you. So put your notes aside and give me two minutes of your time. Look right in my eyes. There's some people in the room today who need to do just that. Like you've been running for a long time from the thing God called you to do. I, I, I love like today's growth track. I love that you can just sort of jump on the thing because some of you have been running from the thing you know God called you to do, and today's a great day just to say yes, like I'm gonna, I, God called me, like God called me to do that thing. I'm gonna say yes today. I'm gonna make good on my vow. There's some folks here that are in hell. You know what it's like to pray a prayer like Jonah. It's not pretty. It's, it's not even the words that you want anybody else to know, but you just feel like, man, I'm in hell, and I don't just need you to fix this. I need to be born again. Like I, I need this whole thing to, to change. Matter of fact, why don't you do this? Why don't you close your eyes and just right where you are, would you bow your head? And nobody's looking around. Nobody's moving. None of our team are moving. But if that's you, like if you're in that spot today and you say, I desperately need to call on God today. Like if the God of the universe would really answer and find me in the middle of my marriage, that's, it's not broken. It's hell. In the middle of my, you know, what's the anxiety in my heart, like right now, my my heart's beating out of control. Like, I just, I got to get some help. It's hell. Or maybe it's your kids. There's nothing hurts like pain that your kids inflict. You raised them right, and they're living in hell. Like, it's terrible. Let me just encourage you like Jonah. Like, this is your moment. Nobody's looking. If that's you, and you need to call on the Lord today boldly.
whether you've ever done it in your life or you're just going to come back today. That's kind of what happened to me. I was, got saved when I was younger, but really it was my later teens, almost into my 20s before I really said yes to it. Maybe that's where you're at today. You just want to come back. Wherever you are on that, if that's you, would you just boldly raise your hand and say, man, that's me. Come on, keep your hand up. I see you. Thank you. I see you. I see you. I pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus. You don't have to say it out loud, but you got to say it from your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you today. God, if you'll answer Jonah from the middle of a sea in a well, you'll answer me in the middle of my problem. God, I don't, I don't know how I got here, but I think you're rescuing me from here. God, I don't need you to just fix me. I need to be born again. So, God, I give you my whole life today. Come on, I, I can pray this with you, but I can't say those words for you. I give you my whole life today. I surrender everything to you today. God, my hopes, my dreams, my future, what you've called me to do, everything at my marriage that's broken right now, my kids, my business, my plans, my college, my school, everything that I am, God, I surrender. God, I'm not leaving any part of me out of this prayer today. I give you everything. I'm in hell, and I'm asking you to hear me. Rescue me. Save me. Come on, say that. God, I repent from running from you all of these years or all of these weeks or just the last few days. I've been running, running, running. I repent of all of that. I give you my whole life today. I start over today. Come on, say that. I need to begin again today. And I say yes today. Come on, say that out loud. Everybody say yes. In Jesus' name. And everybody shout a big amen. Come on, let's celebrate right now. Would you do that? Why don't you put your hands together for, come on, you can do better than that. Give him the best praise you've given him all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. Hey, thank you, Pastor Mitch, uh, for that incredible message. We, uh, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Come on, North Rock, let's give it up one more time for Pastor Mitch. Awesome. Well, hey, if you prayed that prayer today with Pastor Mitch and God really did something in your heart and you really just felt, felt that moment and I, I just wanna be the first to congratulate you and to celebrate with you. We celebrate with heaven today. And hey, if you will, pull out the connection card in the seat back in front of you or it might have been the worship guide that was handed to you as you came in today. And um, on that connection card, if you'll check that box at the top of it that says, I committed my life to Christ today. Uh, we just wanna partner with you here at North Rock. We want to uh, if you put that information on there, that's our hassle-free guarantee. We're not gonna come knocking on your door. We're not gonna come have dinner with you. And Well, I wanna have dinner with you if you'll cook for me, but that is for us to honestly just be able to send you a thank you letter, giving you some next steps. We wanna put a book in your hand, an incredible resource that tells you of, hey, this journey, what this journey is gonna look like, what you, can need, uh, what you may need, and um, just some ways that you can get connected here at the church. But hey, um, like I said, we wanna celebrate with you. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna continue worship through our giving today. So as the ushers prepare and as you prepare, I wanna go ahead and mention a few ways here at North Rock that you can give. Uh, they're gonna be thrown up on the screen behind me, but uh, I wanna mention our text to give, very safe, very secure. It's uh, actually the way that uh, my wife and I give. We, we really enjoy it that way. We also have our mail or bill pay. You may have seen it out in the lobby. We have our giving kiosk. Uh, the buckets are gonna be coming down here in a moment, uh, and we also have our own line. Uh, so a very, very safe, secure ways to give. And hey, as the ushers come now, I wanna go ahead and let you know and celebrate with y'all what our giving is going to this month. Actually, this Saturday is Serve Day, July 15th, and we're partnering with over 300 churches nationally. And it's incredible how, uh, how we're actually impacting San Antonio and partnering with other churches here in our own city. North Rock is having 10 different projects, 10 different projects where we get to go and impact the lives of others. We get to go in places that some people don't even know there's need. And you guys get to feel that need. We get to buy supplies. We get to be the boots on the field. We get to be the ones getting our hands dirty. And so I wanna go ahead and point out we have the serve day tent outside. If you walk right out through the doors and go to your left, you'll see a serve day tent. And we'd love for you to sign up and join us. Uh, you can also find out more information about the projects there. If you don't go by the tent, you can still see all of that online. We have that available for you. But also, if you're just not able to make it, if you already made Saturday plans, we'd love for you to join us. But 
If you cannot make it, you can still partner with, uh, with us through giving. So if you'll go online uh, and make a donation, if you'd like to do that, you can go through the missions tab. And we'd love for you to join alongside us in Serve Day this week. So everybody say sign up at the big white tent. There you go. So hey, if you'll stand with me, I wanna go ahead and point out we do have prayer available in the back. We would love to join alongside you in prayer. And hey, y'all have an incredible week. Have the best Sunday afternoon ever, and we'll see you next week at church.